Hello, Wellesley. How are you doing? I'm Anthony Reibel, and with me today we have... I'm Troy Gobble. Nice to see you. I'm the principal at Stevenson High School. And uh, I'm the director of research and evaluation here at Stevenson High School. Been with Troy, what now, 12 years? 12 years. 12 years, 12 years together. Yeah. Um, and we've been, uh, we've worked on a lot of different things together in different roles, but um, uh, specifically evidence-based grading, uh, uh, and that's been uh, about a 10-year 10 10-year 10 project at this point. Yeah, it's been 10 years since the first team started. And I think, you know, we're here to help and do our best to try to answer some questions. So we want to talk about why we decided to make the change, how we decided to make the change, and sort of what was the results of the change. So just to get kicked off, like why? Why would we, why would you want to change the way that you grade? And I think there's two, two big reasons that I, I see. The first one kind of happened on accident. And when all of the grade books went online in the early 2000s, suddenly parents and kids could see all of the grade book work that teachers had done inside the magic grade book before. So if you're my age, you might remember a red grade book with a big grid inside, looked like a ledger. And different teachers had very different ways of calculating the grades and adding up the grades and the percentage that they used. And it all made sense to each teacher, but it didn't have to make sense to parents and kids. And so we started to have the collision of, you could see the way people were grading and folks were like, "What's why is, why is homework 20%? Why is homework 10%? And why is, why did I get a zero on this? And oh my gosh, a zero has a really big effect. And that really made our, our families and kids think differently about grades. So that's, that's one reason why I think we took off on this. And the other one that I think is, is, was more purposeful was we started thinking, how do we make sure that we're a school built on learning and not built on collecting points? And so when we really got to the point of like, what is learning? We realized that in order to learn something, there's a space where you don't know it that well. And so when you, when you do something, do an activity in class, you might not get 100 on every single activity. But that doesn't mean you're not learning and growing. And over time, we wanted to build a system where it would show that in a couple of weeks, I could get to mastery, and that could be an A. Like, that could still demonstrate what I knew. So I think those are the, yeah. those are the two reasons that I've... And I think where I kind of come into that story, Troy was leading that, and I think what I started to notice not only as a teacher because of those two things when I was teaching in that, uh, during that movement, um, uh, but also then leading this uh, initial phases of this grading change was that students started to, because of that visibility and trans, um, transparency and because of the focus on learning and learning standards, kids started to take a little bit more ownership over their learning. Right. And it was kind of naturally happening, um, but there was this kind of tension building between how did we historically teach and view students as learners and how are we now seemingly have to react to this change and teach a little bit differently where the student is at the center of it. Um, so our focus then, a third focus kind of entered in was um, this change is yep. about student agency and efficacy. And uh, that's when we started exploring the portrait of a graduate. Yeah, I wish we were smart enough to think of the agency thing right off the bat, <laughs> but it actually, it, we realized that, that was part of it once the kids had some control in the way they were graded. So that was, yeah. I'm glad you brought that up. So then we, we also, um, it's, I think it's seven years now uh, ago, we started, we built what we call a portrait of a graduate. And you can check it out on our website if you haven't seen it. But what we wanted to set out to do was to talk about what is the outcome of a student? What should a student look like when they graduate Stevenson High School? What are the, what, what, what do we expect them? What are their characteristics? What do we want them to know? And it turned out when we interviewed families, kids, teachers, administrators, school board, we all sat down and thought like what we brainstormed ideas. And almost all of those things were about how do they work? How do they approach their learning? How do they make sure they're a good community member? It wasn't like, do you know the, the atomic mass of boron? That, was never, that never showed up on the list. And so the real question was, how do we build a grading system that helps support all of those skills, those social skills with our students? And so I think 
that really yeah. did that work. And that was, that was one of the things that I still think I'm most proud of in this work is the Portrait of Graduate. Yeah, me too. Um, I think it acts as a figurehead for this work and reminds us how to um, mobilize some of these ideas of agency and efficacy into our instruction and our classwork. Um, but I really like the result. Um, yeah, it's also become a great way for us to plan forward. So if that's the outcome of what we expect our students to be, every question we ask now is like, how does this new idea help us get there? How does this get us to that point? And so I'm, I'm really excited about the future of using that. And, and I think in terms of how we grade and how we give feedback to kids, it's critical to teach them how to do the exchange of that feedback. So to me, that was, that was critical. Yeah, I, I'm all, I've wondered this because we were not always in the same room yeah. while this was being rolled out to faculty and, and community and, uh, you know, and, and how we were always weren't in the same room when we were rolling it out to staff and how we were using it to change our pedagogy. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I always wonder because when I, when I was rolling it out to staff, it was chew and chats where we had lunch and talked about it and ideas that connected to it. It was lunch and learns where we were kind of building this, uh, you know, larger awareness around it. Um, and for me, the momentum that was being created from the portrait of the graduate for the, our grading change was palpable. Like it was very observable. So, but mm -hmm. I just, I'm wondering from the parent standpoint, like in the community, like when, how did you guys roll it out to the community? How did they become aware of it? Um, yeah, so, so we actually spent six years, six years where we were operating with some of our faculty grading in a traditional points-based system and some of our faculty grading in our EDR system and giving feedback around s skills and standards. And so that, um, that was an interesting tension point for families because they would get half of their report card or more, might be points, and then as we went further along, half of their report card or more was more of the, 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 the evidence-based reporting model. And so, in that case, you could imagine some families were, I like it, I don't like it. And, and um, I remember we, we held parent breakfasts once a month where we would invite parents to come in and talk with the superintendent myself. And um, to, to be 100% honest, for the first five years that we were, no, probably the first three years we were doing it, um, every time a parent would come in, we'd get a group going, they'd talk about whatever was the issues of the day. And eventually someone would say, what the heck's going on with that new grading system? Like, I, I'm not sure I understand it. I don't, I don't like it. And we would explain it. We would talk about all the benefits of it and we would describe what it was good, um, what, it, what it could do for kids and how it could help. But it felt very much like the superintendent, his name is Eric and I, were defending the system. And then I remember it happened like this. It was, it was um, one, one year, I think it was about the fourth year in, parents all in one room, somebody brought up, oh my gosh, what the heck's with that new grading system? And another parent in the corner of the room said, hey, whoa, 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 this is an awesome system. Here's what happened for me. My students struggled for the first couple of weeks of chemistry and wasn't able to, to do the work and eventually was able to figure out the standards and the skills and able to do the work and able to earn that A. If it hadn't been for the new system, they would have piled up poor grades during that time, C's, D's on quizzes and tests, and would never have been able to earn an A in the class. And the, the parent was like, my kid's passionate about being a science major and was able to learn their way through and grow into it. And so that, that parent like defended the work right there to the other parent. And from that moment on, at every parent meeting we had, there were always some parents' room were like, no, 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 you don't understand. This is why this is better for your kid. And it wasn't always kids that struggled. Sometimes it was kids from AP classes. And eventually the folks that believed in the system far outweighed the number of people that were confused by it. Now I will say it's different. And for all of us, again, you know, I went to high school in the 80s. Tony went to high school in the what, 2010s. No, I'm kidding. Nine, did, nine, did, nine, yeah, nine. you know, we all know 90, 80, 70, 60. That's what we lived. Um, and so it does take constant teaching to the families. And what we're learning now, now that we're 10 years in, it's still new families showing up. And those new families still learned 
in the old system. So we we can't stop teaching the community. So that's a long-winded answer no, to no. your question, but I think the other part that really also helped change that we didn't is once we got the portrait of a graduate established, it was very easy for us to say, well, it says right here in our outcomes that we want to build a kids with the, that have efficacy and and um, you know they have a growth mindset and they work they work through tough problems and they're focused on their learning. That's what the system does, and so we can describe that for them in those conversations. Yeah, and I think um, <clears throat> some of the realizations that go along not in the parent community, what you story you just talked about, but in the classroom with kids and teachers where I was more involved, I think there was these initial years of what is this, figuring it out, but about that fourth year again, there were a group of our teachers that, you know, they took a survey through their um, teacher association and out of the 90 that were surveyed that were doing evidence-based grading at the time, 86 said they would never teach another way. Um, and that was a big inflection point for me from my role. Um, because it's showing that teachers saw value in it um, and uh, thought it was good for kids and also their uh, own uh, wellness and, and as a teacher. Mm -hmm. So um, that was that was an interesting um, kind of inflection point. But it was interesting to hear you say that because that was about the same year that I was yeah. seeing it with the teachers as you were with the community. So um, what about some defining characteristics of EVG? I know I have like a couple of them um, that I'd like to share, but... Do you have anything that you would say, you know, these are kind of the tenants, principles? Well, the, the most important thing for me is that we should put the power of giving grades back in the hands of the professionals. And so what I don't like is in an old system of 90, 80, 70, 60, you'll hear things like, well, I'd love, I, you know, you did a great job. I'd love to give you an A minus, but you got an 89.3. And the, the, you know, the thing is calculated out that that's a B plus when instead it should be a, a group of evidence collected. Here's what I know about your learning, all the learning over time. And then we allow the teachers to make the judgment. This, this should be, it should be a judgment based on evidence that tells, I, I've worked with kids, this is where I believe the success of your son or daughter sits. Yeah, and, and I would agree with that. I think that was the big one. I still remember an admin team meeting that Troy and I were in and uh, I think it was the first time that I mentioned uh, uh, professional interpretation evidence. I was reading Gusky and Marzano at the time, uh, and it was coming from there. And I mentioned at an admin team meeting because we were talking about zeros right. and, yep. and, you know, 50% is the lowest score. And I said, hey, you know, there's this research out there that just says we should use our professional interpretation to judge evidence. And the room was kind of quiet. And I remember one of our division directors going, uh, can you say that again? And not that that was like, you know, the seed for, throughout, but it was like a pivotal moment there mm -hmm. where Absolutely. in our perspective, we started to not hyper-focus on zeros and the traditional grading conversations that had always plagued us. And I do think the zero is an important one too. And I think we have kids who don't turn things in and it, it's been true since the dawn of time. It's still true in our new system. I'm not gonna say that we've solved that problem, but what happens in, if you give a student a zero, they haven't done their junior research essay, something really important, right? So I, there's this work that I need to do. I didn't do it. If I give you a zero, I'm telling you, I never want you to do that again. Like you've got a zero, you, you're not getting any points for it, and I don't need to see your ability to do that work. Well, that's not about, uh, my expectation is every kid that's a junior should complete their research project. So I'm expecting everyone to do it. If you give a zero, they're never going to be able to redo that work. So in our system, we say like, look, I need evidence of your learning. What is it you're, you're not off the hook. You still need to do this for me because it's critical enough for the learning. So that one I think is a big mind shift that teachers and parents and kids all have to imagine. It's not, it's not like you didn't do it, you're punished. It's you didn't do it. I need you to do it because it's an important task for your learning. Yeah. And I think uh, that's, you know, another big piece. I think what we talked about earlier with the portrait of a graduate, I think that's a big tenant of this. Uh, I think one of the defining characteristics of evidence-based grading is that it's focused not on 
a better looking grade book or more information from your grade book, which a lot of alternative grading systems tend to promote. Right. Um, but our evidence-based grading system is focused on this idea of self-reliance, student agency, and that's all in our portrait of a graduate. So I think one of the differences that we see between evidence-based grading and other alternative grading systems is that it is squarely positioned on helping students become agentic, self-reliant, self-governing people. Um, and that plays into our instruction, our assessment, and our grading, which is kind of where I want to go to next, sure. which is the phases. Um, so to achieve the vision of this and started to, you know, when this, start, with the, when this idea started to gain some traction um, uh, in the first couple of years, we needed a plan to take how many teams? Like um, 220 teams? 220 and, teams, 330 teachers, yeah. Through, through and to this goal very deliberately, intentionally, so there, um, everyone felt good about it and had the space to uh, ask questions or pause if they needed and uh, recalibrate. So we needed a, uh, a plan, just a lack of a better word, and we came up with kind of these 10 phases that were naturally already happening, mm -hmm. but we kind of saw, oh, this is a, teams like to talk about rubrics at this point, or in this point of development, it's really about instruction. And we pieced together a 10 phase um, process that all of our teams uh, went through. Um, yeah. Tony led that work and it was amazing. I'll let you talk yeah. about it. But I think the idea that we would we would purposefully time that work out, I think, made a big difference because I'm you know, to be also honest, we have teachers who I, I think a small number, probably ten percent of our teachers, who if we said you could grade any way you want, I think some of those folks would be like, Let me go back to the old way. Mm -hmm. And so we were able though, through the success, we could we could we had like a, the ability to try it out and with smaller groups and we had the ability for other teachers to watch it happen. And so once it was observable to them, it was very hard for them to argue that you couldn't do it. And so the, even the folks who I think would be like, I want to go back to the old system, have to admit that it works and we can do it. They just like the old one personally better, yeah. which is not about the organization, so. Yeah, I think the uh, portrait of a graduate gave it purpose, yep. right, mm -hmm. um, for this initiative. The phases gave it structure, yep. right? And within each of the phases, there were kind of defining attributes and, and concepts in there that made this, this process, this new initiative, this new type of grading, slightly, in the eyes of our teachers, slightly better than what they were doing, right? Yep. There was a little bit more of an advantage. I agree. And then we were able to pilot the teams who went through the 10 phases. We were able to get some pilot teams, which Troy said made it, you know, observable. Um, and we uh, did a lot of lunch and learns and talks with oh those gosh. teams. They presented at board meetings. Um, what's good about it? What's bad about it? What's different? What's the same? You know, student voice, teacher voice, reflection. One other thing we were able to do is be nimble. And so as with smaller groups doing it at the beginning, we were able to change the system. In the first few years, we made a lot of big changes to make sure that when we got to most of the faculty, we had built a, Tony had led this, had built a really good structure for what it should be. And so we were able to learn a lot in the smaller sort of trial phase. Yeah, I would say by year three or four, we were kind of clicking with the 10 phases. And it settled into what what do we believe this to be? Yep. And then, so the 10 phases, you know, went from success for every student, what is that, to curriculum, to uh, rubrics, to assessment, then to scope and sequence. I've got these memorized because I've done <laughs> these for 10 years. Uh, <laughs> then to instruction, then to uh, grading, gradebook, feedback, and intervention. And a team of teachers had one school year to get those done. So basically a couple of release days here and there, yep. their PLC time, uh, maybe some summer hours that you know they submitted to get approved to work. But within a entire school year, plus a little bit of linger in the summer, they were able to launch that following year. So, um, and I don't wanna, that is so important. The, the purposeful professional development for the teachers so they didn't get thrown in not knowing what to do. They had a whole year to make sure they understood their curriculum, their instruction, their assessment. That was that. I mean, Tony led all that work, and it was really 
why we were able to be as successful as we were. Yeah, and I think, you know, we gave respect to dissonance. I mean, there was going to be challenging conversations, and we wanted a process that was going to respect that. Right. Um, and there were some teams who said, can we just pause? Can we, there were a couple of our teams that took yep. two years to roll up mm -hmm. because they were stuck on some things, and that's absolutely, that was absolutely fine. Um, so yeah, the phases were a big, big deal. It kind of gave it the, the structure that it needed to, to, to kind of move forward. Yep. And then I think we ended up, you know, what was it, right before COVID, we were almost 80%, almost 90% of our teams were there and then COVID hit and... <laughs> the first year that we were home, the, the year that we were home for COVID at the beginning of the school year was the first year that everyone went um, yeah. <laughs> EBG, which was, <laughs> which was interesting, yeah. right? For the last groups that went, yeah. but... Um, it, we didn't get to have quite the big celebration that we had hoped to have here at school, but uh, it, I, it was great. I got them Hershey bars. Yeah, so exactly. That was the least we could do. People do anything for chocolate. Um, yeah, so that, I think just some other things we maybe want to touch on here is just what have we learned, what changes have we seen, some of the impact. It, I started off talking about how the, the grade book going online really changed what we thought about the grade book and grading, I think, as a profession. And what we see now is we've realized the gradebook is not an, an accounting space where we're collecting information. The gradebook is a communication tool. We are telling families and kids where you are in your learning. So it should tell a story. And that's the, like, when you think about like, practically what's the biggest change for the families and kids, it's that I can look into the gradebook and see how am I doing? How am I growing? What, you know, like what, what's, What's right for me? What do I need to fix? How do I get better? And that to me has been, that's the best mm -hmm. thing. It's a communication tool. Yeah, I think, you know, some other changes I saw initially, I haven't surveyed in the last couple of years since COVID, but we continue to have end of, end of course surveys with our students and teachers, um, specifically on our student voice, EBR voice surveys, grading voice surveys. You know, the top answers were school's less stressful. Um, I can fail and recover. Uh, I can learn from my mistakes. You know, like consistently those yes. were the top positive answers. Now, admittedly, there were negative answers like, you know, school stinks. I don't know where I'm at, <laughs> you know, but that was, you know, few and far That was between. from yeah, that Tony was from and I's <laughs> kids. Those were, that was actually our yeah, kids. Those those were our kids. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, one one survey that we give that's that's a little unique, and you can look this up on our website, we, we actually survey graduates so over the summer, um, one year out after they've graduated and then five years out after they've graduated, our counselors call graduates and ask them a series of questions. And a couple of them that they ask that are really important to us is, you know, wherever you ended up, how prepared did you feel like you were for that next stage of life? And in the first year, that number, um, the, the question is like, more prepared than others around me, um, equally prepared or less prepared. And we are in the 90% for more prepared than people from other schools, where, wherever I end up, right? Whether it's in career or in, in college. And then in the five year survey, that number is actually even higher. So like, so when they've been five years away from the school, they can look back and realize what they learned here to help change them and made them more prepared for school. We also hear a lot from our kids that when they go off to college and they have those, uh, you know, the college experiences where you have a midterm final, right? All I've, the only grades I'm gonna get are a midterm and a final. By teaching them to, to think through what I know and what I don't know, teaching them to engage with the learning around skills, kids actually learn to do that for themselves. So kids identify that they're better able to be ready for that midterm. They know what they can and can't do. They're able to study better. And so those two bits of information have been really valuable for us because they're taking the skills from the grade work and making it uh, their own so yeah. that they can use it. Yeah, it goes back to the portrait of the graduate, self-reliant yep. learners, connecting to others, committing to learning. and you know, we get that question a lot. Well, will colleges go for this? And, you know, how does this play out in college? And our, our comment is just that, is you've got two tests in college, but who's responsible for getting the student to those tests? The student in college. Right. So they need self-reliant habits. They need reflective habits. They need to know how to, uh, they need to develop a self-enabling uh, inner voice, which we work on, another thing in this grading system that we work on with our feedback. 
Um, so all those things really go into play with, we have seen changes in our students, the way they talk in the hallway, the way they talk about assessments. It's very skill-based now. I gotta provide evidence toward this skill or standard. Um, no one's talking about big tests anymore. I gotta study and memorize for this test. Like all that's very muted if it is still here. Um, you know, and I think just, you know, I think the conversation students are having about their learning in the class is another impact that uh, I think uh, a good impact from this from this work. Um, even at, uh, at my, I have kids that go to school here. Even in, at my table, at dinner table, I'll have. But you know, my my kids will say, "Well, I'm approaching in that skill. Like I'm not there yet, and, but I'll get there. Like, but I'll get there." And you don't hear kids in the old model where I have a C. They don't say, "Well, I'm going to get to an A." They're like begging out, "How do I get three more points to get to the next level?" Right? You're trying to like incrementally get better and claw your way through points. But what I hear, and it's it's my son as well, is like, hey, I'm not there yet, but I will be. Like, of course I'll get there. Why wouldn't I? Yeah. And I think just to insert right there is even if your daughter and my son and our school was a standards-based school, we still wouldn't be at that conversation. Right. Standards-based grading in our view and our research and our experience is – is still kind of a quasi-conventional grading system. Even though it's talk standards and aligned standards, it doesn't get to that efficacy agency piece, that student ownership piece of learning, the conversations, the relational parts that EBG has given us because we focus solely on evidence and judgment evidence against skills. And it's ultimately EBG is more of a mentorship style grading than it is yep. than standards based grading is. and and I think it's many standards you still end up at an average someplace yeah, right true, and I think yeah. what's what's really happening is we get the idea to say like I've I've gotten you to the growth right I, I like yeah. I, like an apprenticeship yeah. right like yeah. I'm teaching you through the work and I should get you to here before the end yeah awesome and I think just you know we've been talking about a lot and yep. just only have a short amount of time I think just one last thing to kind of point out um, is uh, that our third party um, uh, mechanisms are, you know, SAT, ACT, um, uh, you know, MAP scores in our sender schools, mm -hmm. um, uh, AP, you know, all those scores uh, remained the same, if not went up. And that, you know, we, we didn't really want to claim in this, and we weren't really looking for every kid to become A students in this grading system, just full transparency here. What we were looking for is that as we shifted more ownership to kids in their learning, and they became the drivers instead of the passengers in their learning, what would happen to those third party exams? And they did not go down. Uh, if not, they've gone consistently up. Uh, but, um, and, and, you know, we're a school, we, we value the AP College Board experience. Um, we gave 6,000 AP exams here as a school last year, which I think, you know, and, and part of the process of this is that by giving kids the ability to learn and grow, we have more and more kids engaging in the most rigorous curriculum. So they feel like they can take more challenging classes to the point where, um, you know, 70% of the kids who graduate from Stevenson take AP Physics before the public school, right? We're, we're a public school taking all, anyone who comes, they're, they're graduating with an AP Physics. 68% of the kids who graduate from the school have taken um, AP US History. Um, you know, we, we, because more and more kids are choosing to take the test and our pass rate on the test has stayed consistent between uh, our, our uh, average score on the AP tests somewhere around a four to a 3.8, like back and forth each year, we're in that same space. Still success, but giving more kids the opportunity. That's what I think the key to me. Yeah, I, I mean, to, to, in sum, we could say this grading system has kept the same high achievement, right? but now we've bundled in that high self-efficacy and agency for kids. So, so more kids feel like they're being successful. Yeah, exactly. All right. Well, since we're on video, we can't really do a back and forth questioning, but it's been yep. nice. Hope that helps. Yeah. Please feel free to reach out if you would like to talk more about this. We'd love to, to help yeah. in yeah. any way we can. We're passionate about what it does for kids, and we'd love to help you along yeah. your process. Yep. Yeah. Good luck. Have a good evening. Thanks.